equation calculates the likelihood in which there would be alien life beyond our own planet and within our own Milky Way galaxy. So it calculates that there would be about 400 billion stars in our galaxy, about 20 billion of them are similar to our sun, and about one-fifth of them have planets orbiting their stars um, that are in the habitable zone, which would be very much like Earth. It also calculated that if only 0.1% of them actually harbored life, then there would be 1 million planets out there that have alien life. So um, Enrico Fermi, who uh, was actually the scientist that created the first nuclear reactor, is a Nobel Peace Prize winner for that, um, casually said on a lunch break one day, why is it that we haven't heard from any aliens yet? We've sent out like lots of different um, signals, the Voyager missions, everything. We've sent out signals and we haven't gotten anything back, no radio signals, anything. So he said, you know what? Maybe interstellar travel isn't possible. Now let's first talk about what exactly interstellar travel is. Interstellar travel is traveling light years um, uh, in distance. So light year, as you guys know, is the time that it takes for light to travel in a year. So the Milky Way galaxy itself is 100,000 light years in size, which means it's going to take 100,000 years to get from one end to the other of the Milky Way galaxy. Now, there's a few different problems with this, um, and there's a few different uh, discussions with the Fermi paradox. Um, one of them has to do with possibly these technological civilizations have not lived long enough in order to even achieve interstellar travel because interstellar travel takes a very long time. So you have Earth, uh, which has been around for only about 4 billion years, and then you have um, intelligent civilization on it. And if you were to calculate how long it would actually take for you to do interstellar travel, maybe we cannot live long enough for it. Now, there are three different types of civilizations that the Fermi Paradox covers. Uh, one of them is this, that the civilization on a planet is able to, I'll use my globe, is able to harbor all the energy of its planet uh, to sustain life. Uh, Carl Sagan actually calculated that the human population is at about 0.7. Um, of, a, of a civilization instead of a one type one civilization um, and that's because we haven't been able to harbor all the energy yet of our planet in order to survive uh, the type two civilization is that they can harbor all the energy of their of their uh, Sun of their star their orbiting star um, to actually sustain life and one of the different uh, like hypotheses out there is something called a Dyson sphere and a Dyson sphere uh, let's actually say that instead of this being a planet that it's a star a Dyson sphere completely encapsulates uh, the star itself and it can actually um, regenerate or re actually use its energy to survive. This is very science fiction. Um, and then the third type of uh, a civilization would be type three, which means that the civilization is intelligent enough to harbor all the energy of its galaxy. So to us, this would seem like a very... Um, intelligent species that'd be really crazy now there's also something known as the great filter and the great filter might be one of the explanations as to why uh we haven't come in contact with any aliens yet the great filter is the barrier for life to overcome this just means that there is something in the way that is stopping um intelligent civilizations to be able to achieve interstellar travel or to be able to achieve living long enough to communicate with other species out there the Great Barrier can consist of a few different things. One theory is that um, the beginning of formation of our galaxy was just under such harsh conditions that planets could not live long enough to start to form life. Because every in the early stages of a galaxy formation, things are very dramatic. Things are all over the place. Things are probably still all over the place in the Milky Way. Um, it, it, there's really harsh temperatures, really harsh conditions. Um, lots of stars don't really live that long. They're constantly dying. Um, and then they're constantly being reborn and new stars are being born. Then planets don't really live that long either. So it's possible that we may be the very first civilization. The next issue with the Great Barrier is that um, maybe technological civilizations do not live long enough, like I mentioned earlier. A perfect example for this is human life. Humans have only been here between six to eight million years. And that's considering like Neanderthals. But as far as technological civilizations, it's only been maybe um, a thousand years, a couple thousand years. Um, and so this being said, with everything that's going on with science these days, uh, we have not lived long enough to actually achieve it. And maybe other civilizations haven't lived long enough either. Um, and then because of that, 
uh, it takes for interstellar travel to be possible, you have to move at least close to or at the speed of light, and we're not up to that capability right now. Um, we don't even know if it'll even be possible because physically, in order to move at the speed of light, all of your atoms and your molecules are going to break down into, and become energy particles. You will literally become light. You'll become a light ray. Um, and so you will not be human anymore. So you won't actually be able to, at least theory-wise, theory -wise, you won't have a consciousness. You won't be able to observe possibly coming in contact with an alien species because you might just be light. Um, and the other issue with that is that um, even if you are able to move close to speed of light and you can still be alive if our if our society and our technological civilization does advance that far, um, you would be traveling for so long that you, by the time you reach your next point, they might not even be there anymore. Earth won't even be there anymore. You might not even be alive anymore. And so that's another big issue is that uh, with a human life being 100 years and then with us being around for only a few million years and then the Earth being around for a few billion years, in order to do interstellar travel, maybe travel to another galaxy, travel to another part of the universe, that's going to take hundreds of thousands of millions of years or hundreds of billions of years. It's a very long time. So this is also part of um, the Great Filter. However, now the Drake Equation, um, it has a few adjustments made, and this is because of Sarah Seeger, uh, who is an exoplanet researcher, and she searches for, for extraterrestrial intelligent life. So she works for SETI, S-E-T-I, um, and she's been part of all the research that's found, like, Kepler 186F, it's found Proxima B, it's found Trappist 1. Um, so all the different exoplanets that have been found out there um, have been part of uh, her research. Okay, now let's get back to the Drake equation. Um, so this is the paper towel that I had uh, posted of a picture of the other day. Um, and this was the original Drake equation. Now, um, Sarah Seeger, who, like I mentioned earlier, is one of the exoplanet researchers who has um, been making a lot of discoveries in exoplanet research recently, um, had created this new version of um, the Drake equation. So here, I have it all written out for you guys. Um, I hope you can see that. You have um, N still represents the number of planets out there um, that actually would have biosignature gas, aka life. Um, N represents the number of M stars. M stars are very important because M stars are the ones that um, would give off enough heat um, to the, a, a planet in their solar system in the habitable zone to actually sustain life. It also doesn't have a lot of radiation. It also doesn't give off a lot of stellar wind. Um, and M stars like our sun. So M star like our sun. Um, F cube represents the fraction of quiet stars. So you're also going to calculate how many like stars are similar to our sun. And then how many stars, quiet stars just means also like very low radiation, not a lot of stellar wind too. So there'd be a high chance of um, the exoplanet actually being able to form a, uh, an atmosphere. And then you have F of HZ. HZ stands for the habitable zone, like I mentioned earlier. So Earth uh, resides in the habitable zone of our solar system. This just means that it's at a perfect distance from its star where it's not too hot, not too cold, and life can form. So this is the fraction of rocky planets in the habitable zone. Rocky planets are very important. You don't want a planet that's super icy or some other material because uh, if you have a rocky material, then it actually has um, higher elements, more complex elements, which would um, aid to the existence of life. Then you have F of, Z of, of O, and which stands for the fraction observable system. So this just has to do with um, however many uh, systems we've been able to actually observe. So how many sol uh, planetary systems. Then you have F of L, which is fraction with life. So if we actually did find life, we'd have to calculate that in. Then F of S is the fraction with a spectroscopic signature. A spectroscopic signature, when you have um, a spectrometer, um, it measures uh, different types of elements that are key to uh, the existence of life. So like you need um, heavier elements other than hydrogen and oxygen, you also need um, uh, ammonia, you need um, helium, like iron, um, all those different elements are very important. And so with the spectroscopic signature, you'll be able to actually observe and detect that there are certain planets that actually do contain this in their atmosphere. And if they do, then that's very important. It means there's life. So these are the numbers that we, they, uh, Sarah Seeger, this was actually on uh, harvardedu.edu. Um, they had actually found. So there's about 30,000 um, M stars that we know of 
um, only about 0.2 of a fraction of quiet stars, 0.15 of a fraction of planets in the habitable zone, 0.001 um, is the, ob the how many um, observable planetary systems we've noticed, and then one is a fraction with life, and then 0.5 is a fraction of spectroscopic uh, signatures. So we come out with the number of being the number two. So we found two planets with a biosignature gas, uh, which would make sense because about um, however many planets we've actually found, we've been able to observe this number being at two. Well, that's uh, my brief on the Fermi Paradox and also the Drake Equation. Um, it's very exciting stuff. I thought I would cover this just because um, I think I've had a few of you guys actually suggest me talking about the Fermi Paradox, and I love it. I've had some crazy talks on some of my photo shoots with like really awesome uh, people that are really into this stuff. And um, I just felt like I also had to talk about that because of all the different discoveries being made. Um, it's like really cool, Trappist one and all that other fun stuff. So um, yeah, okay, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and stay tuned for my next one. Um, my ne For next week, I'm going to be building my own telescope. I am very excited. Um, I got a whole bunch of like office supplies. It's gonna be like a really basic Galileo uh, telescope, but then the following week, I'm probably gonna do like a really more advanced one. Um, I was. It took me so long to try and get the lens. I was planning to do this like weeks ago. So I was actually trying to like warp my own uh, glass to make my own uh, magnification, but then I realized I'm not that good at it. So. Um, um, I will be doing my video next week on making a telescope. I will talk to you guys then. Thanks so much for watching. Bye!